actually um, have done very well, if I understand it, with the 800-pound gorilla in the space for software for disc jockeys um, and, and karaoke clubs or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, something like that. But he actually uh, like went to England to pick up his Tesla Model S so he could drive it back to New Zealand. I'm not sure how that works, but it apparently worked out pretty well. And, um, and, and they're, of course, in the same country and similar interests. I found it interesting, and we, in fact, we did a episode of EVTV, including uh, some video of their uh, very early uh, examination of a uh, uh, Chatamo charge station that comes from a company that I've talked to many times and never actually elicited an actual product from them that would operate uh, in Australia, and their name is Tritium. Tritium. And they had a three-phase AC system years ago, uh, which was uh, unobtainium, but very nice, I, apparently, in my description. I think it was AC code, yeah, unobtainium. It, it eventually <laughs> did become obtainium somewhere, but I didn't. Wave yeah. Sculptor 20 and Wave Sculptor yeah. 200. That's the one. So they are uh, have embarked on a thing, and so I'm not going to limit it to that. Um, many of you may have followed uh, Nick's uh, uh, Miata build, which is... Uh, with a uh, HP VS 35X2 crammed into a little red Miata, and it was kind of interesting the way he did that. Uh, and, the, and the Miata is a very popular vehicle uh, for conversions. I would say one of the more, more popular sports car things. So I asked them to describe vaguely what they're trying to do in New Zealand because it's kind of a closed country of four million people. Um, much less roads than we have here. It's actually a doable thing to set up a charging network for the whole country. It could, could be done um, it, by a couple of guys. Um, and so, kind of a microcosm type thing. Uh, would you all please give a warm welcome to Steve West and Nick Smith. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty bright that thing if you stand in front of it. So. <laughs> anyway, um, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So what the hell are we up to? Okay, we've got some some people. Um, introductions. I mean, Jack's done a great job of introducing us, but I'll um, <coughs> elaborate a little on my part in this crazy adventure. Um, as Jack mentioned, uh, I was successful in the DJ software industry. Um, I formed a company back in 1998, not intending to have anything to do with DJ software. It was uh, actually to commercialize a digital signal processing algorithm that changed the tempo of music without changing the pitch. And that was quite an inventive thing at the time, and we ended up selling that as a product to recording studios and film and TV post-production houses. And that did okay, um, certainly didn't make us rich, but it got us um, a good reputation for customer service. And then we went into the DJ space. I invented a way to control MP3 playback using vinyl records. So we make these vinyl records with no music on them, but a special control tone that the software is able to track and in a lot of ways reverse engineer the movement of the record and then it applies that same movement to an MP3, and so for, a D, for the DJ it seems as though the music is on the record, when in fact it is not. And so then um, instead of having to carry hundreds of pounds of records to a gig, they just bring a laptop and two records, and then they're able to play hundreds of thousands of songs. And so we, we pretty much uh, changed the, the whole music scene, um, especially in the US, East Coast, um, Vegas, LA, uh, it used to be the case that a DJ would have to choose very carefully what music they were going to bring along to a gig ahead of time because they had such a limited ability to carry the music. Uh, now, with the, be able to use a laptop, well, they could play anything. And so that resulted in a whole genre of what they call mashups, where they take totally disjoint genres and mix them together in a uh, you know, most unpleasant manner. But, <laughs> but that's right, so that's, that's uh, the, the, the particular arena that I've been successful in, and that's what's funded this um, 
enterprise. Uh, Nick? had a lot more to say about nope. South Bexley. <laughs> so uh, a lot of you guys have been here before, you would have seen me in uh, 2011, I think it was, well, 13, 13, where uh, Jack uh, volunteered me to give the keynote address and uh, I told you all about myself then, but uh, just in case you weren't here, um, I'm a mechanical design engineer, uh, I've been running a small design consultancy for a number of years and uh, uh, probably about five years ago, um, when I came to the first DevCon, you might remember I was whinging about my life and how working for uh, customers was pretty sucky. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, shortly after that, I actually met Steve as a result of this uh, this EVCON crowd, and he only lives <coughs> at the time about 25k away from me. I've since moved a lot further away, but <laughs> <laughs> his fault. Um, and uh, we've just sort of come together in the EV scene and we've been doing a lot of charity promotional work for electric vehicles in the past. And um, about six months ago, I, I got really fed up of work and I uh, sold out to my business partner and I've basically been doing mostly nothing for the last <laughs> six months except uh, volunteering with the electric vehicle charity work and um, helping Steve out with the charge net thing. And uh, he sort of finally decided that, uh, you know, Steve doesn't do guilt, but I think Dee convinced him that I ought to be paid for a little bit of this stuff. And that when I get back after the trip, we'll be, we'll be uh, launching into the real, the real work of getting this all underway. Yeah. Anyway, so the way this came about, um, back in January, the uh, first couple of weeks of January, we decided to do a road trip. Um, I had recently acquired the Tesla Model S and another fellow, Carl Barlev, that's this guy right here, he had just moved to, back to New Zealand from Norway uh, where he had been working as uh, kind of uh, yeah, project manager for Tesla installing superchargers there. So he had brought his Tesla from Norway to New Zealand so he had a pair of Model S's and decided to do this crazy road trip from one end of the country to the other. And what that demonstrated pretty clearly was that New Zealanders um, you know, basically lives in the third world as far as EV charging goes. And that prompted me to then launch a uh, design, a nationwide rapid charging network, DC charging network. <laughs> Um, these other guys, yeah, who cares? <laughs> hey, what about your wife? Oh yeah, <laughs> that's my wife. <laughs> lovely wife. She is very lovely. She talks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't know if you guys know very much about New Zealand. Um, is this kind of your? Yeah, you want to talk about us? Yeah. All right. Okay, so uh, just on here we've got uh, a topographic map of New Zealand, and on the right is. Uh, population density map. So you can see uh, we've got this horrible range of mountains through the middle and it goes right up through here. This is actually the tectonic plate joint between the Pacific and Australasian plates. So, um, New Zealand's pretty split. Um, this is the west coast of the South Island. Virtually nobody lives there. It's wet, wet and rainy and cold. And the uh, the east coast of the South Island is where all the agriculture happens. Um, everybody lives here, basically. New Zealand's got 4.6 million people. Uh, Auckland, or the greater Auckland area, has a third of that. Uh, probably the other third of the population is spread around the North Island, and the rest scattered through the South. So um, people live in very disparate communities, so it's a bit like Cape Girardeau is to St. Louis, you know, you'll, you'll live and work here and you'll run up to, to St. Louis maybe once or twice a year. So um, New Zealand's a very similar collection of towns like Cape Girardeau. So we have people doing short trips, maybe uh, the average commute in New Zealand is 40 kilometres a day, or 26 <coughs> miles. So that puts uh, most people well within the, the camp of uh, electric vehicle ownership would work for them. The only trouble is that uh, if you're going to 
run off and do more than 46 kilometres a day. Um, New Zealand's de facto electric car is a Leaf, <laughs> and that's you know 80, 80 to 100 k, depending on how, you, how you're driving it. So you can get to work, you can get home, then you're stuck. So you know a bit of quick recharging would uh, really do the trick. Fortunately, most people in New Zealand have garages or at least off-street parking. Um, we have an extremely high uh, per capita car ownership rate, probably due to our isolation in all the uh, communities. So we've got uh, a three and four <coughs> ownership rate of light, light vehicles. So um, that sort of sets the scene for New Zealand's uptake of electric vehicles, which we're, we're hoping we're going to accelerate a bit through our, through our efforts. So Steve's going to tell you a bit about the uh, how the electricity work group works. Yeah, I mean, a lot of you guys are um, either electrical engineers or have a, a, a pretty familiar with um, how electricity is generated and distributed in the US. But I'd provide a little bit of information about how it works in New Zealand. Um, so it's really crazy. We have uh, this hybrid model where the um, Actually, I'll, I won't go into too much detail. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> Here's a cool thing. 80% of our electricity generation is renewable in New Zealand. Yeah. So I think that puts us about fourth in the world. It's, it's pretty good. And the reason we have so much renewable generation is we have quite a lot of rain, and so we have a lot of hydroelectric power stations. And then the balance is made up with uh, geothermal generation. So the combination of those two are both considered uh, to be renewable, and then the other 20% is a mixture of uh, natural gas and coal. But we, we do have some wind farms as well. Makes up about 5%, I think. So I've got a slide about that. So um, the entire country, all combined generation, 42,000 gigawatt hours, which is some tiny percentage, probably at 1% of what the US generates. Distributed to 2 million customers. Average household in New Zealand, eight to 9,000 kilowatt hours a year. So that's probably a lot less than the typical US household. 930 a month, 930 kilowatt hours a month. So this is a little bit less, not yeah. really very much less. Okay, and obviously there are you look at other countries like Denmark and Norway, and they, they use a lot less than, than us or the US. The um, largest customer, electricity customer in the country, though, is an aluminium smelter, and they consume yeah, 5,400 gigawatt hours a year. That's so about 15% of the entire country's <coughs> generation. So what I uh, alluded to before was a kind of hybrid model. We have a free market for electricity generation. However, it's dominated by five companies, as naturally happens. You end up with whoever's... And they, they, they duke it out, uh, in theory. The actual... The main transmission up and down the country is state-owned. So we have a, a kind of backbone, uh, high-voltage DC link that connects the North and South Islands together. Uh, a whole lot of um, reasonably high voltage, so 220 kilovolt, 110 kilovolt lines. Um, but then the distribution out to the customers is done by monopoly private companies, <coughs> but they are heavily regulated by the government because they are natural monopolies. We recognize that it would be uh, ludicrous to have competition in the the space of power lines. You can't go around doubling up on all the power distribution. It would be crazy. So we, uh, as a country, we allow them to be monopolies, but then we regulate their profitability based on their um, installed asset base. And then retail is, um, again, a free market. So we have five main retail companies, and you can sign up to any retailer you choose. And then, in theory, somewhere behind the scenes, it's all worked out so that the electricity you're buying from your retailer is coming from their preferred generator. A lot of that 
actually happens behind the scenes as financial transactions rather than actually, you know, you can't literally control whose electrons you're buying. <laughs> so this diagram that sort of shows how the, the electricity flows one way and the money flows the other. Um, it's quite complex and not all that interesting really. But we run a wholesale market behind the scenes as well, so the actual, the generators do all compete and you can be sourcing, as a retailer, you can be sourcing your electricity from, um, you're buying from a market and it, so the price goes up and down in response to demand. If you turn this into more familiar units like cents per kilowatt hour, just knock off the zero, so it's five cents, 10 cents, 15 cents. New Zealand. Um, our currency is worth about two thirds of a US dollar, so not a third off as well. I suppose I could have done that in US dollars, but I stole that graph off the internet. But you know, clearly very wide variations in pricing depending on the conditions. So if um, the hydro lake levels, if they're low, then prices go up. Um, if it's the middle of the night and Everything's idling, the price goes down almost to zero. I think here in the US I've heard sometimes your pricing goes negative at night. They'll pay you to take power off the grid, mm -hmm. which is an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. well, I can't find that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a little chart that goes back uh, a few decades showing the, the mixture of generation in New Zealand. <coughs> Do, and totally dominated by um, hydro, hence the large percentage of renewables, and that's been the case for a long, long, long time. Um, there was a period where coal got to be quite popular here, but in recent years it's tailed off, it's down to about 5%. So not in favour. Wind, it's this little sliver here that's been growing and uh, geothermal, again we've, we've used geothermal traditionally for a long time, uh, we've, it's a very active country volcanically speaking with the intersection of two tectonic plates, but that's become more and more popular, uh, it's a, you know, it's quite a good, you know, there are good economies that go along with building geothermal plants. A lot of people confuse um, renewable with zero carbon, Certainly not the case. Uh, hydro is pretty close to zero, but uh, geothermal not. Geothermal plants on average emit about the same CO2 levels as uh, a gas turbine. So. Solar? Solar, no, no, it just doesn't, no. The, uh, being all, our, our governments have uh, went through a, a period in the 80s where they embraced uh, free market philosophies. And so uh, they pursued all forms of uh, subsidies or any kind of encouragement towards renewables. This has happened because of the economics of the situation. It's just really cheap to um, build a hydro plant and generate power for free forever. Same with geothermal, practically free forever. Um, solar has been too expensive to to, for people to justify on a personal level for, for a long, long time. That's obviously changed. But as far as feeding into the grid, you're going to get paid virtually nothing. You'll go, if you're lucky, you'll, they will pay you what they, the cost that you've offset them by avoiding the cost of the hydro or whatever. And that's at the actual generation side, you've seen it's pretty cheap. So um, you get a few cents per kilowatt hour if you're lucky, which, you know, the only way solar stacks up at the moment is if you're able to self-consume and offset the larger cost. That's pretty much level. true here. I get 1.75 cents avoided generation cost. Right, but you got a pretty fat subsidy for doing the internet <coughs> in the first place. I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah we don't get shit. What about, what, what's the retail uh, homeowner pay for electricity roughly? Roughly 26 cents New Zealand, so about My, my so about personal bill cents. averaged out to 30 cents a kilowatt hour, including line charges and connection fees. Yeah, we have a mix. So we have daily charges and per kilowatt hour charges. So in the US, it'd be like 20, 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah, about, yeah. about that. That's twice what we pay here. Yeah. 
But California's higher, so. California's a lot higher. Yeah. But California's also uh, steps. Yeah. Quick question, why does uh, geothermal generate so much CO2? I thought it was just shoving water into the ground and out comes steam. Yeah, you would think so, but apparently it, <laughs> it's, it's not the case. This is, it's a statistic that surprised both of us. Okay. Yeah, most that, people would think, years ago. think the same way as you, yeah. that, that it's a pretty obviously why, why on earth is there CO2 emitted, but it, okay. it does cause CO2 emissions. Quite a lot. Uh, I don't know why I threw this in. I think it was just to show, yeah, roughly again how the the distribution of generation and just transmission and then consumption. Here's a diagram of that um, transmission grid I was talking about, and some statistics about how many miles of lines. So a lot of it's done with high voltage AC lines, you know, that hundreds of kilovolts. And then um, we have this, this dotted line here is the DC link, which is, runs at plus or minus 350 volt, uh, kilovolts DC. And um, what I learned when I visited this um, hydro dam here, it begins, is that uh, if they have a fault, one of those conductors is you know, uh, broken, they can use the earth as the return. And they will so they'll drop to half power, and that's why that so they run them literally positive and negative 350 kilovolts relative to earth potential, and then a failed conductor can be substituted. They use the earth and for the return current, which is amazing. And apparently, it's fine to do, just not for long. It's not good for the ground. Have they tried to do like a super cooling of the conductor to help with that, or it's just a wire? It's quite. It's a very very old. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oil cooled. Oh. Yeah, I believe it is oil cooled. Um, so, yeah, that, that local distribution is divided up between these um, 28 monopoly companies, and they have different geographic areas that they control. All of these little dots are the grid exit points, which are where they connect to the transmission grid that runs up and down the country. Um, so, like I said, the government regulates their profitability in a, an overall sense. I think it's six or seven percent return they're allowed to generate on their asset base. But there are no rules about how they achieve that profit. So they don't have to um, get six percent return of each individual customer. They can allocate that profitability however they choose. Which means, being a monopoly, if they don't like you, they can punish you with whatever fees they choose to impose and there isn't a squat you can do about it. I just jump in and, and point out that because there are so many um, local suppliers, that means we're faced with a particular challenge rolling out this network. We have to we have to deal with mm. all these different suppliers and that yeah, it's, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous in a country of four and a half million people that we need to have um, you know, 28 different companies to deal with. There's a little bit of uh, technical detail there around the actual length of lines and voltages and eh, it's not all that interesting. Get back to this one. And what's next? Oh, I'm back to the start. All day. All right. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the New Zealand vehicle fleet, since that's kind of relevant, and why EVs are good. Nick sort of alluded to some of these facts already. Um, if you look at our overall light vehicle fleet, we've got 3.1 million vehicles, 37 billion kilometres a year. Uh, if you restrict it to just passenger vehicles, then uh, that drops to 2.7 million, travelling 31 billion Ks. If you then further uh, put aside diesel vehicles, they uh, make a pretty small percentage of, of those vehicles. and makes it easier to do the numbers. Um, two and a half million vehicles traveling 28 billion kilometers, 
So that's an average of 11,000 kilometres a year, which is 30 kilometres a day on average. So that's 20 miles a day. Uh, that's really, really short trips on average. Um, da -da 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 -da. You guys don't really need to see all this. It's blah, blah, blah. CO2 emissions. You can go through the exercise of calculating um, what happens if you convert the fleet to electric. And so, yeah. Here we go. So unfortunately these are all in metric <coughs> units. So, um, and I'm not going to be able to convert them on the fly, but you can look at the ratios at the very least. Cost per 100 kilometers, about 20 bucks to about five bucks. So you know, you've got that four to one reduction in cost uh, taking all the retail prices in New Zealand into account, and that's going to save a typical driver $1,500 a year um, and offset, you know, six. Uh, if, if the, we converted the entire fleet to electric, that would be six megatons of CO2 that we could eliminate uh, and as a country save ourselves four billion dollars a year. So that's kind of what's driving our enthusiasm for electric vehicles. It's not just how, that they're fun to drive, it's also that we as a country we have to import most of the oil that we use so we'd rather not do that. We would rather that, the, that we drive our vehicles using locally generated Electricity than imported oil. Yeah, you've got a natural question. Gas also, also important. The what? Sorry. Is your natural gas also important? Uh, no, actually, no. we we have we do have natural gas. New Zealand actually New Zealand. sells oil. Yeah. We, we, our, our oil is too good a quality to burn in a car, so we, we actually sell it off to plastics manufacturer mostly. So you can take care of your own plastics and your own fertilizers. Then. <laughs> well, basically, but. Um, we have we have to sell the good stuff and then we buy the rubbish <laughs> back to burn the cars. <laughs> so when we had a, took a look at um, why people weren't uh, immediately buying electric vehicles in New Zealand, the, there were definitely you know lack of awareness was the, the number one reason, but also uh, the vehicles are relatively expensive, though we do benefit from receiving used vehicles from Japan and Japan has healthy subsidies for their EVs, and so we benefit from that. Although it makes it extremely difficult for the local car companies to compete, because actually, our government provides no subsidies. Uh, actually, uh, the second-hand car, oh, second car market's been put under pressure recently because countries like Sri Lanka have uh, cottoned on to these cheap electric cars too, so we're now uh, starting to compete with other countries for, for stock. Sure. Um, you know, and one of the things I think Kiwis love to go on road trips, I'm sure um, you guys do too. It means that that range anxiety is a real issue, and that's another reason why a nationwide network of DC charging stations should uh, make a huge difference. Just to remove that objection from people's minds. Um, so, given one of the things that I kind of skipped over but was quite important, I should have probably pointed out, is that the power that's delivered to end users in New Zealand is 230 volts right out the bat. So that's 230 volts neutral to phase. Um, three phase power is everywhere. So every single residential street has three phase power running up and down it. And each house then what tends to happen is they just tap off consecutive phases to neutral for each uh, as, as they go down the street but it means that if you really want to you can get three phase power at your house you just gotta buy three houses in a row in one <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's one way <laughs> that's one way of doing it or you could just dig a trench and put in a cable <laughs> one charger for every three houses yeah so the um the and, and the, the, the way that you, in terms of three-phase power, the, the common method of um, describing the voltages to refer to it as the phase-to-phase -phase voltage, not phase-to-neutral. So the 230 volt 
single phase is 400 volt three phase power, but it's the same thing. Me? Yeah, but you're speaking. See? You said there was a DC bus for your high voltage? Yeah, that's right. So at least they convert it to AC? Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah, at each end of the DC link, they convert it. That's just the link between the two islands. Yeah, okay. and it's bi-directional. They can run that. They can flow the power either way, north or south, whichever they need. How, how are they doing that? Is that a real old link? And they're using like MG sets or something? Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to go back to Benmore and ask them. <laughs> no idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. They rectify it at one end and then at the other end. I don't know how they then convert it back to AC. Perhaps some enormous power electronics. And yes. An incredibly big building that they wouldn't let us in. Like a human sized so, fly, fly screen. <laughs> so, what do we need if we want to? I mean, obviously, yeah, you can charge from AC. What that means is that because there's 230 volts everywhere, it, it means that actually. Our normal, so our normal power outlets are rated for 10 amp delivery at 230 volts, so 2.3 kilowatts. Um, you know, that's fine. You could recharge a leaf in, what, about 10 hours with that kind of power. Uh, if you do put in a, an EVSC, then you can do it in maybe, maybe six. Um, but that's still too slow for road trips and, and the like. So definitely DC charging is the way to go if we want to support people doing road trips or topping up during the day. But what's missing? Well, have a look at the business case. <laughs> so this is in uh, New Zealand dollars, 40,000. So I mean, US you're doing about 25 grand for one of these 50 kilowatt charging stations. If you expect a 10% return on your investment, which, uh, and let's say that you're making a 50% margin, then you would need to be turning over $8,000 a year or $22 a day. Again, this is New Zealand dollars. I haven't translated it to US currency. Uh, but in New Zealand, we actually only have 350 EVs. We've got, in terms of plug-in vehicles, we've got 800 or so. But the other 450 are plug-in hybrids, like the uh, Mitsubishi Outlander. And those cars do not have a DC charge port, not in New Zealand. So the New Zealand car companies, when they brought these vehicles in, have decided to not put DC charging on them. Um, one reason being there was no charging network, and the other being that hybrids don't uh, have, you know, they're, they're not going to get stranded if they run out of charge. They have the backup of their, their gas engine to use. So they're like, meh, save the couple of thousand dollars cost to put that port on. But they're changing their, their tune now that we're talking about putting this network in. They are, they are saying that they will bring cars in with the DC charging port. But 350 EVs are not uh, enough to fund, you know, to support a, a viable network at any scale. Um, <coughs> but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> Because, uh, you know, why not? <laughs> when you look at uh, this, is, I'll, I'll go to the next slide because it's really interesting. Technology adoption. <coughs> this is one I stole off the internet. Um, you may have seen something similar. This is one that's referenced to a number of years since the technology was invented. So you look at something like the automobile, and it's taken a, a long, long time <coughs> to be adopted. Uh, this is specific to the US. Same with the telephone and the airplane and electricity, these are technologies that took decades and decades and decades, um, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years to be adopted. But then you look at uh, more modern technologies and the rate of adoption has accelerated. You look at the VCR and the radio, microwave, TV. So they, they had a fairly long resting period before they got adopted. But then when they did, it didn't take long at all for microwaves to make it into 90% of households and televisions and VCRs and then even more modern technologies like cell phones and PCs. Again, there was an even shorter period before they were adopted and the acceleration that curve is really um, exponential in nature. So if you look at 
a country like Norway, which is well ahead of the curve, they again have the same exponential growth curve and it's essentially doubling per annum or more the sales of EVs and they're up to 23% of car sales in Norway are plug-in and all of and of, of which about 19% are pure electric and the other 4% are hybrids. So it's already happened there and we believe it can happen in New Zealand too. It's just a matter of time. So we're willing to put, well, we, I, I'm willing to put, invest in a network that will probably be quite idle for a number of years until that growth curve supports it. Yeah, I can just point out Norway is kind of a special case. And again, these things tend to get um, uh, worked by government policy. In the case of Norway, to register a new car is over $100,000 in fees. And they're way free fees. <laughs> so it's not unusual for the registration of the Porsche or whatever to be more than the cost of the car. Our, um, one of the directors, Carl, uh, would um, vehemently defend that, that policy because he sees it as fair taxation against the damage that petrol vehicles do to the environment and health costs and the uh, pollution and such like. And that that simply they take the, the tax away from electric vehicles because they don't have the same <coughs> detrimental effects. Yeah, so instead well, of I, socializing I the, make the, the cost. case, I wasn't reading why they did it, but yeah. the Norwegians don't wake up and say, oh man, this is going to be good for the planet, so 20% of us are going to get AVs. <laughs> for uh, sure, it's an economic yeah, decision it's rather it's than a um, <laughs> economic uh, advantage that's set up by the airline. Norway, by the way, is one of the biggest oil producers and the highest per capita income in, in the world. But they want to sell the oil, not use it. And, um, they have kind of limited roads, so they don't really want a lot of cars. And and, and their population is very uh, high standard of living. So uh, if, if they didn't do this, they, everybody would have 12 cars. Uh, and and they, they just don't have the road system or the room for that. It's kind of mountainous like New Zealand. And uh, um, so, it can literally be a hundred thousand dollars to register a vehicle, and they waive that for the electric vehicle. And that's why the twenty percent penetration that somewhat distorts the adoption curve, wouldn't you think? <laughs> <laughs> Is New Zealand considering an eighty or a hundred thousand dollar registration fee for their production? Definitely not. Uh, so, so that may not come directly into play. I, I hope it happens fast there, but I wouldn't. Uh, it, there's a little distortion there for Norway. Yeah, but I think that the EVs themselves have enough appeal uh, that they will be adopted. I mean, we're starting from such a small number, it's, um, it's not so much a matter of if as when. So this is a diagram of the, the design of the network. A lot of stations in Auckland, naturally, because that's where a third of the population live. And, um, we made the decision to charge people directly for the electricity, so pretty much the same as what they would see on their power bill at home, plus a per minute charge to discourage people from uh, occupying a valuable resource for, for longer than necessary. So essentially they're renting the machine off of us while they're using it. And um, presenting it this way seems to be, people are fine with it. We originally had a, a different method that was just based on time and people were able to do the calculation they're like oh my god you're charging me double what I pay at home I'm never going to use it but then you phrase it this way and they say oh I'm paying exactly I'm, that's even less than what I pay at home and I'm happy to pay 25 cents a minute to use the machine so that seems to work out okay I don't know, do you want to talk about the, the tritium yeah okay. Okay, so I've uh, got a pretty picture, Steve. I didn't even actually realise Steve had photoshopped this until last night. <laughs> he pointed out that it's got our V-fill on it. So, 
Um, so these are the, the tritium V-fuel stations that we buy from a um, manufacturer in Australia, based in <coughs> Brisbane. Uh, full Chademo spec 50 kilowatt DC charging station, uh, 50 volts to 50 to 500 volts. Um, hopefully we'll confirm that, but uh, they have complained to us that how long it took them to meet the Chademo standard. So um, I'm pretty much inclined to believe them that they they have achieved this. So uh, that's going to open up these stations to uh, converters as well. Let's see. Uh, we we're able to, to use them. Um, they're configured to charge uh, to 80% by default, or you can uh, give it a double tap and take it all the way up to 95. And as it says, 25 minutes to fill a leaf, that, that sort of uh, power input. Um, so there's, there's a, an idea of the physical size. Um, you may have seen the unboxing video we, we sent through to Jack recently. Um, the, the stations are, although they have two handsets that you can only use one or the other at any given time at the moment, I think there is a, a double head unit um, in the pipeline. Uh, so we have the Chatamo socket on one side and we have elected to go with the CCS Type 1 socket on the other. And the reason for that, <coughs> if you have a little style, you, you, you'll recognise the Type 1 and Type 2 uh, level 2 inlets, so, so the uh, the Type 2 very, very common on the European spec Tesla and uh, a lot of the newer vehicles in Europe. Um, as I said before, New Zealand's de facto electric car is the LEAF. Um, that comes with a Type 1 J772 adapter. Um, that has meant that a lot of the, um, shall we say, for free AC charging stations that have been put out, put in throughout the country have all been type one, level two. And uh, so following on from that, the auto manufacturers, every new model that comes into New Zealand is going to have a type one adapter um, to be compared with <coughs> the infrastructure that's already hit. So following on from that, uh, that means that uh, when they finally do arrive with DC fast charging, they're going to be pushed towards supplying us with the uh, Type 1 combo, so we can still use the, the AC charging infrastructure. So um, you saw the, the little map of where we're going to be putting them. They're going to be at about 80 kilometre centres throughout New Zealand, uh, with little clusters, obviously in the high population areas. Um, so what are we looking for when we when we put one of these units in? So, you might recognize the transformer box. I'm told they look very similar yeah. here in, in America. Uh, that's a 400 volt three phase transformer box. Uh, they come in varying sizes from 100 kVA, 200 kVA, 500 kVA, depending on what you want. This is actually in the, the local area where I live. Uh, that's about. Uh, this one right here. Let's see, huh? This one? Yes. Yeah. This, so is the top one actually. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is just these two units are only about a hundred yards apart. Um, so this is about fifty-five kilometres from the centre of Auckland, and it's another uh, forty-five, fifty-five <coughs> kilometres to the centre of the next town. I'm just off the main highway. Um, and this is a very popular location for people to drop off and they buy bacon from the local. Uh, pork butcher and uh, <coughs> tour buses pull in and, and feed Chinese tourists ice cream cones from the local the shop there. So this is an ideal location for us. E either one of these two, ideally the bottom one. Ho hos and ding dongs, Jack. So you know mm -hmm. we've got um, a 200 kilowatt transformer right next to the street side, parking there, and um, somewhere for people to go for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, Public bathrooms just down the street as well, so this is ideal sort of location. Did you nose into that spot, or did you do it in parallel parking? Um, well, it sort of depends on which car you're talking about, but in that particular case, it would be public street side parking, um, <coughs> and it would be just up to you to position the car where you like. That's that's a parallel street parking yeah. in that location. Um, 
long yeah, we, long. you saw where the rubbish, the trash can was on the side of the road where we want to put our station right where that was ah, and, okay. and shift the trash can. Um, in parking garages and stuff, we, we um, put it for, in a nose-in configuration. Uh, we seem to have a some kind of technical difficulty. Technical difficulty, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just keep talking, man. Yeah, so yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I was just wondering the um, New Zealand population's awareness of like environmental concerns because America is kind of built on oil. We sort of love this stuff, and the majority of people from what I've noticed don't really care, or <laughs> if they do care, they they don't talk about it. Really. But yeah, it, then the people I've met from New Zealand are more aware of the environment. We sort of market ourselves internationally as 100% pure New Zealand. Um, <laughs> of course, that's not always true in reality, and, and it's. But uh, we we are lucky that we have such a small population and a, and a, a large country in, in comparison to the population. So there is a lot of unspoiled natural environment, and the 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 political structure in New Zealand. Um, I'd say probably the the third most, um, oh, third, fourth equal, yeah. We've got the Democrats and we've got the Republican equivalents. And then uh, the Green Party is actually quite um, quite vocal and quite popular in New Zealand. And then we have uh, a representative Maori Party for the local. So um, how important is tourism to New Zealand? Incredibly important. I think it's. Uh, our primary industry is dairy, and I think the tourism industry equals it, or, or, or is slightly higher. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly valuable asset mm -hmm. to the country. And what are they coming to see? They're coming to see the geezers and the, um, well, basically, you come to New Zealand, you can see, you can see uh, France, you can see the Alps, you can see fjords from Norway, you can see uh, Some like tropical lakes, of natural yeah. Beauty, uh, nature yeah. Type. We've got, you know, Lord of the Rings filmed in one country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the whole sweat, you know, Mount Doom is just in the middle of North Island. It's a popular <laughs> ski <laughs> field, actually. <laughs> um, I have actually stood on that volcano when it erupted. <laughs> um, fjords. Yeah, fjords there in Southland, down at the bottom. So that's very Norwegian-looking. Um, then you get up to subtropical in the upper North Island, lots of um, almost jungle. Uh, yeah, we've got pretty much anything you can think of. We could, uh, <coughs> certain areas up in the North Island that are all sand dunes, you can film a desert movie there if you want, and then you go and film an Arctic movie down south. And just, yeah. Sorry, Jason. Yeah. Uh, was there any stickiness when you talked about your pricing model there? You mentioned the 25 cents per kilowatt hour and then the 25 per minute kind of thing. Uh, I've seen it just up in Canada, for example, from province to province, there's different regulations. And you can get into some pretty bad situations when somebody who's <coughs> charging EVs is reselling electricity. Because, you know, there's a licensing issue where you need to be uh, an EV. Yes, that? theoretically. Yes. Well, so you want to talk about the reselling aspects there? Um, yeah, actually it's pretty straightforward to register as a, an electricity retailer. Oh, fantastic. Because, you know, we have this open market and we're, we're free to do that. So that's what we've done. So, like, does that make you, like, number 28 or whatever? <laughs> no, those, those, the 28 were the lines companies that handled the um, distribution of the electricity. They're not the retailers. Retailers, there's dozens and dozens of them. But five main ones. Yeah, yeah and one of our directors is also uh, has a his own electricity retailer, huh? and so yeah. okay. he's good. giving us a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> Specialising in uh, wind, isn't it? Green energy. Yeah, it's it's carbon, carbon zero. Very right. Okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't get the tritium one to work. Without. Okay, I, I was going to show you. Actually, it was just a time filler, but we're already 10 past 11, so <laughs> I was going to show you how we install one of these stations, but it's uh, a very simple matter of a, uh, a small concrete footing and, and four, um, we call them uh, chemical injection anchors, we probably do, or, or expanding anchors. 
Very, very simple. Um, we just need a three-phase three -phase connection, as close as possible to one of those big boxes as we can get. Um, the further away it is, the more it costs, so we're, we're always looking for a deal. Um, so carrying on with where they're going, um, obviously the Auckland City Council is uh, representing 1.5 million people. It's been a, a conglomeration of a number of different cities, I think uh, five, mm. five cities have been con conglomerated into one, they called it super city, so uh, what we actually have in Auckland is a situation where we have satellite council offices and they actually end up doing a lot of driving between one and the other. Um, Steve approached their fleet manager and he was uh, very happy to, to move to electric vehicles if we could uh, provide some, some charging infrastructure for them to use and we said yep we'd be very happy to do that it just has to be 24 7 available to the public as well so, so council's in um, the Dunedin City Council this, this is uh, a small t a small city of what, about a hundred hundred fifty thousand people in the South Island uh, we just made a, a an approach to the local um, Board of Commerce, and uh, all of a sudden they leaked on us and said, We want one, we want one. So uh, we're committed to getting one in there before Christmas. Um, Gull is a, a fuel retailer in New Zealand. Um, both of these locations we're noting here are actually truck stop locations unmanned, so they're keen for us or happy for us to uh, stick a unit in. One of those. We have had an issue in Wellsford though. Yeah, um, but that's actually with the electricity board, not the yeah. So <laughs> I, can, yeah. I can talk about that. Yeah. So um, I said before that they're um, monopolies, the distribution companies. They're, they're the ones who actually connect the power, and they can send you a bill any size they feel like. And in the case of Wellsford, when we asked for a connection to the transformer that was literally 12 feet from where, our, like, where we wanted to put it. Uh, they gave us a, a price indication of $50,000. <laughs> and it's uh, by a wild coincidence, they are uh, planning to install some DC fast charging also in Wellsford. <coughs> um, and there's very little we can do about it. They can, they're a monopoly, they can set the price. So we're gonna go probably to a couple of towns either side and split it's, it's on a main route from Auckland north, and there's, um, so instead of having one stop, we'll have two stops mm. at different locations. But they're, they're effectively able to um, behave like that in an anti-competitive manner, and there's very little we can do about it. Okay, so um, we also have been in discussion with a major retail chain. This is uh, the warehouse in New Zealand. It's very similar to Walmart. Uh, I don't know if it's maybe slightly better dressed clientele, but <laughs> <laughs> um, not much. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is a hopefully this will be a flagship installation. This is only about five kilometres from our head office, so we'll be able to install it, keep keep an eye on it, and uh, just troubleshoot some of the back end and, and whatnot. This is Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, this, this isn't <laughs> yeah. real. Steve's pretty good with the Photoshop. So. Um, negotiations, you know, early days, so we keep running into problems we never really expected. Um, fortunately for us, this there's an underground car park directly below this thing here, so basically they've just drilled through the floor and we're plugged into a, a transformer. That, that nice was a big one. Yeah. 750 kVA. Yeah, plenty of spare capacity. We can put two of these units in with, with overhead for another couple of AC charges if we wanted. Um, but then we run into it. lawyers. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, protections over who owns it, what happens if anything goes wrong, all that sort of stuff. Insurance. Liability. Yeah. 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 Liability insurance. <laughs> yeah. Can't be that hard, right? <laughs> so, um, fortunately, the warehouse is a, is a national chain. Uh, they're very um, environmentally aware, have 
sustainability policy, their their chief executive or um, founder is a very big proponent of of the green movement. And uh, we've also been approached by Z Energy, which is basically a complete buyout of Shell in New Zealand. Uh, it was bought by a retirement uh, investment scheme and rebranded. So uh, they're amusingly sort of uh, repositioning themselves as an energy provider, not, not a, a fuel provider. And um, lovely Jerry has uh, asked us to um, install a few stations in some key locations. Um, three in Auckland, two in Wellington, which is the capital, because they won't be too far away from the parliament buildings, and one in Christchurch, all on service station four courts, with good which access to their... Homos and ding dongs. Homos, ding dongs and fair trade <laughs> coffee. <laughs> yeah, but that was you know that was not part of the plan. We no. never we never intended to put these things on petrol forecourts like gas stations. But um, they came to us and they were willing to come to the party and and um, pay all the installation costs, which on a, a gas station forecourt are significant. Mm -hmm. uh, not just the it's not just the engineering of the problem it's the the fact they have to shut down the entire station mm -hmm. while they're working on it is any spark hazard around volatile mm -hmm. fuel you know it's be a disaster so uh, and that costs them a lot of money so yeah, but no more dangerous than the uh car wash or the or the little vacuum station that they have right <laughs> sure but uh usually there's a nice big green transformer box right there as well so uh, yeah we just get some some of the branding on the units and we'll, we'll be away with those ones um, so we've got the units themselves we can um, basically have to register with us uh, get one of these sweet little RFID tags that come in a number of fashion colors uh, we can uh, activate the station using this, this key fob uh, RFID <coughs> tag, um, but uh, who here is aware of the plug share app for the phone? That's only about half of you. But, um, this is a, a, an app on the phone that will tell you where charge stations are, uh, tell you what kind of station they are, give you the opening hours and, and such like. Um, if you rock up to a charge station, you registered with us already, you can uh, Forgot your key fob. You can activate the station through the charge um, through the plug share app at that particular station. Um, if that all fails, we can actually go into our website and activate the station through your charge net login. Uh, coming soon, SMS. Yes. Yeah. Um, so just to show you how easy this thing is, we got. Uh, Steve's wife, Dee, um, did a little video the other day. <laughs> Hopefully we can get this to run. Can we? Can we get it to run? No. Oh, yeah. the trick. <laughs> yeah, it still works fine on my laptop, but uh, Max, you know, can't <laughs> <laughs> um, we can, uh, we can pop back and uh, go to the YouTube video and I think I can play it if I just do it. Yeah, right? Play. 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 Um, it's D West coming to you from the ChargeNet headquarters. I am late for a meeting and I just want to show you how simple it is to top up and get on the go again. So I open up my car. I pull up it in. I take my RFID tag. And I will be charged in 10 minutes, which gives me just enough time to text message my next appointment and apologize for the fact that I'm late, but I'll be on the go with a full car in that amount of time. So this is how easy it is, guys. Welcome to the future, and uh, we hope to see lots of you purchasing and using electric vehicles. <laughs> Just to point out, she filmed that whole thing in 41 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one take. Yeah, one take. Yeah. <clears throat>
Donuts and Big pun? Yeah, we got ho hos and ding dongs at the yeah, yeah, yeah. Ding dong, ding dong. Actually, I must go and find out what they actually are. <laughs> is the noise of the charger actually as loud as it was in the video? Um, it's probably a bit worse on the video because of the, the microphone pickup. It is a bit unpleasant to stand by it for too long because it does it'll keep teenagers away. <laughs> the, um, that's a solid yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a 12. Once, once you get over about 55, you can't hear it anymore. <laughs> so, um, that is a, a known uh, bug, shall we say, known issue, um, that it has a 12 kilohertz, quite piercing tone. Um, they can, Tritium can vary that from 8 kilohertz to 12 kilohertz, and so what they're working on is a, a spread spectrum method to modulate that quickly enough that instead of being a single tone, it sounds more like a hiss. And that should be much less objectionable. Do you want that's in, in development now? Uh, I can talk about this. Yeah, so how do you, how does the you person actually... Your pants think, <laughs> you work with them and get it work. White plays can't 40. <laughs> <laughs> like a little tinny AM radio. Mm -hmm. yeah. Random. <coughs> so we have to scare them away into the shop. They can put it in the side yeah. thing. So the sign up, um, the, our system is based on a, a membership model, you, you join up at the website, but that, it's very easy, it takes about five minutes to, or less to type in an email address and choose a password. Um, and then you register a credit card for payment, much the same way you do at Amazon or uh, eBay, and um, from that point on, then like Nick said, there's um, you know, half a dozen ways of activating the stations, but at the end of the day it's tied back to the credit card that you've put into the system, and so it'll, um, each day it will build your card for any usage you've made of charging stations. Um, but an important consideration is that there are other uh, people, other companies in New Zealand that want to install their own charging stations. And we do not want to end up with a situation where you can't uh, use a station because you're not a member. You're a member of one network, but not a member of another. So right from the outset, we are building in seamless roaming so that that RFID tag you've got in your hand, Jack. Is that what that is? That's what that is. That will activate not only our charging stations, but also the charging stations of our competitors. And beyond that, where it's um, the system uh, actually creates a, a kind of wholesale market behind the scenes, so that you can be a charging provider and have no customers at all. You can wholesale that service to all of the other charging networks in the country, and all of their customers can use your charging station, and you'll get paid for it, but you don't have to talk to any customers or answer any phone calls. And then on the other side, we have retailers with, that have access to customers and can bill those customers but don't even want to own charging stations. So, uh, for example, we have a um, public transport system that we, we have a prepaid card, AT card, or um, there's another one called Snapper. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so we can connect to those systems and then customers can use RFID tags from you know, other networks that are nothing to do with charging. So that, you know, hopefully will help the ecosystem develop in a more healthy manner than you would typically see instead of trying to carve up the country into competitive zones that make it inconvenient to be a customer. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to charge any time. So that comes down to the open platform system as well? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's the open platform as well. So we, we'd, we'd really like other um, networks to use a common platform. And you know, competition's good, isn't it? In New Zealand, we think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, wouldn't competing networks not like the idea of your chip activating their thing? Wouldn't Why not? They They're going to get paid for it. Chip? They'll get paid for it either way. Just easier for the client. Yeah. And conversely, it, lets the, it gives their customers access to our network. Mm. Which, so it helps both. Like, for instance, Vector's uh, based, based in Auckland, really. Yeah, uh, that's all they are. Yeah, all they are. 
um, a vector a vector client could theoretically roam the country on our network and be built by vector. Yeah, but Vector's no, actually the opposite. No, they yeah, don't. actually Vector's <laughs> not going to have customers. Yeah, they, <laughs> they don't want any customers. <laughs> but isn't that the point? Uh, that's the point of proprietary systems is to keep people using your stuff. Yeah, so we're tr we're trying to make a proprietary system an unappealing proposition in our country. Okay. If you do that, if you're an island and you're not connected to what everyone else is connected to, then you you no one will want to use you. There's massive value in being connected <coughs> to the to the whole ecosystem. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Oh, what the next slide? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know. We could probably get to this. <coughs> we kind of already covered this. Um, but we might as well just finish up here and uh, take questions. Thank All right. Yeah. So, yeah, where we at? I'll finish up. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so this is where we're at right now. We're the website's live. We're taking registrations. We've shipped out our RFID tags. Unfortunately, there's only one station you can use them at, and we have to be there for you to come and use it. Uh, we've got this is the unit at our head office. It's uh, <laughs> currently actually plugged into an EVSC unit, so it's running at 20 kilowatts. Um, building systems are. Uh, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're steadily receiving the units now, and the warehouse is filling up, and we've got nowhere to install them yet. So, uh, we've got some work to do in the next three months before Christmas and uh, get some of these things up and running. So, yeah, I'm editing the presentation right now. <laughs> what do we do? I'm, so, we're I'm inserting a picture of a picture. Yeah. I think Steve's just going to show you our warehouse overstocked with charge units. But, uh, um, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Piling up. Piling up. <laughs> Priscilla, the uh, secretary, has got pretty good at using the pallet truck. So <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, I suppose. Questions? Do you anticipate that perhaps uh, retailers of other services will validate uh, charging uh, sheds the way we would validate parking in the big city here? Um, possibly. Yeah, actually. Uh, I can see how that could work. Yeah, I, I can. Um, I've I've been approached by a uh, shopping mall in Auckland that they want to put in one of our charging stations, and uh, their offer is that they will pay us the cost that we would have charged the user. So they are effectively doing what you're saying, validating. Promoting their business to your service. Then. Yeah. Yeah. So they. The, They've done the numbers, they know what they can earn uh, for every minute that a customer spends inside their mall, and it's easily worth it for them to pay right. us. Are you selling the back data to your customers? Where they are, how often they're there, how many ho-hos they drink? <laughs> yeah, so in return for them giving us free rent, then they get that data. Okay. Yeah. So they get the, it's anonymous, but they get the postcode of, the, um, of every customer that um, charges there. So outside the facilities, like you're describing, who you know will basically cover the cost of charging for their customers, you know, where is your working capital coming from? <laughs> those installations. Yeah, so that's why um, my introduction was about my software background and the company that I built. The that's funding this. So this is a long-term investment. It doesn't pay back anything for seven to 10 years. But then, in terms of the profitability of any individual machine, <coughs> one hour of use a day is a 10% return on investment. So it's, it's not, you know, it can be very profitable if it um, gets busy, but we need a lot more electric vehicles in New Zealand before any of those stations are gonna be what you would call busy. Jack? Um, you have a target for all in to plant one of those um, uh, charge stations? It's about the 40 grand mark. You mean the, the cost? Yes, of the unit and then install the yeah. concrete work and then yeah, the sure. leave mm -hmm. up. And, uh, so, yeah, in, in New Zealand dollars, the we pay $30,000 for the unit and then it's about sort of in the five to $10,000 of cost to get it in the ground. So forty thousand New Zealand, you're New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. 
fair station. How do you incentivize people to unplug right away after their car is completely charged? Oh, well, so we'll stop billing them once the charging process stops. Right. But and I don't care if it really if it's plugged in as long as it's not preventing someone else from charging. Well, that, okay. Yeah. So if somebody else could come up and see yeah. if they're finished charging, they, they could go have, ahead and take it out of their that yeah. other person's so car a, and put it in there. The Chidemo plug has a locking mechanism that um, deactivates once the charging process is finished, and then oh, anyone okay. can pull it out at that point. Okay, so as long as they can physically get their car in yeah. close enough to, you know. Yeah. But they're paying twenty five cents a minute. Yeah. But, but not after the charging is yeah. over, though, right? No, Once it stops charging, it stops charging. And oh, then, right now, <laughs> right now we're still. Yeah, still just keep racking it up. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. Then you would incentivize them to you know, right. make sure that they move their car, you know, gun hook and yeah. move their car. Over in the back. Whatever. Yeah, I'm wondering about the, uh, the 30K price quote for a charger. Um, if you have any idea how many chargers you'd have to start buying to get a significant quantity discount, because mm -hmm. that would certainly affect how your. Um, your uh, capital expenses and your uh, operating That is including, time and so forth. that is with that quantity discount. Yeah. It is with a quantity yeah. discount, 20 or the 20. your total projected? 75. 20. Uh, so 20. That's, that's, 20. that's, yeah, around the 25 unit mark. Yeah, so and you're saying if you go significantly more units, you don't get much more discount. Not really. Okay. Yeah. George, is there AC out of your charging station? No. Okay. No, just. Strictly DC. Strictly DC. Okay. The, yeah. They so have actually done that, but it's kind of like a, a tack-on box on the back, and it's pretty ugly. It's not just that. It's also that um, we don't want to provide AC charging at the same locations. Gotcha. We're trying to, you know, you really want to match the dwell time of the vehicle to the charging technology. And AC is so much slower. Yeah. It's more suitable for cars being parked for long periods of time. And it would probably suit a shopping mall much more than a supermarket. So we're targeting locations where there's the, a much quicker turnover of cars. So you don't plug into one of our stations and then go watch a movie, because it's going to be done in 20 minutes. Yeah. Have you talked to any rental car companies about their future plans for electrified fleets? Oh yeah, okay, so there's in the Auckland, uh, Auckland City Council have a subsidiary called Auckland Transport and they are in charge of looking after all the council parking areas and street side parking and so on and they have put out an RFP for a car sharing scheme and a requirement of that scheme is that it uses electric vehicles and so the, then the vendors that are um, putting in submissions have approached us about providing fast charging for those vehicles. So it's in that, that, that kind of, yeah. How is your side game with Uber going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun being an Uber driver. You would be? Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, it's just a one-off. <laughs> you, you mentioned about your uh, wiring them your stations in the uh, uh, transformers that are on site, do you ever have to have a transformer installed or a step down from high voltage or something? Yeah, so we're trying to avoid doing that. <laughs> it's, it can happen, but if, it, if we had a, a location where we had to put in a dedicated transformer, the cost is not that much. A, um, so a 50 kVA transformer, which would be sufficient to run a station, is around $4,000 Kiwi. So if we were going to do that, we'd probably set it up as a charge location with yeah. multiple stations. So you, the places you're putting them have quite a bit of excess capability on site already. Yeah, they typically are those, those like supermarkets and that sort of location. They have big transformers, way, way bigger than they need. Have you looked at or had any thoughts of having your own uh, convenience stores with hobos? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that would uh, imply having to buy some land or leasing land to put it on. But uh, yeah, I'd rather I don't think we're into retail. <laughs> no, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Oh, one more. Yeah. Uh, you may have mentioned this earlier. How do you set up 
how many charges should have been paid? Okay, how many? Um, well, in, in the initial instance, it's going to be one because right. we're trying to spend as little money as possible to get the network built. Um, and so you you know you have to have them every 80 kilometers or so, which is about every 50 miles, so that a leaf can charge to 80 percent and be able to reach the next station. Um, whether we install more charges at any given location is going to be driven by the demand and the congestion, and we can easily detect from the charging patterns whether a station is getting congested. Um, but then we probably wouldn't put a second station in the exact same location. We'd probably find maybe the, if it's a supermarket, there's probably a competing supermarket across the street, and they would like to have a station too. So, you know, spread the love around. <laughs> Okay, I think we'll call it there. Ooh, ooh, but we've got, what? we've got a wee, oh, yeah. we brought something. Yeah, uh, we're, we're over our luggage allowance, so uh, <coughs> please come and take some of this weight of t-shirts off our hands. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we, we brought, brought uh, yeah, a shit ton of t-shirts with us. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe enough, maybe enough for everyone, we're not sure. Maybe. I'm not sure exactly how many we brought, but um, they're mostly um, large and Extra large. And a couple of lady ones in there as well. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the size or Yankee size? Yeah. <laughs> no, we didn't bring the three XLs, I'm sorry. Oh, that loves me out. I'll try this one last one, one last time, but I don't didn't work last time, it's crashed twice now, it's going to extract it from yeah, I don't think that's going to work. I don't think they need to see bolts being put into concrete. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, well that's okay. us.